the seven days of the festival, then on the eighth day, uh, which is the last couple days. It was a day, but now it's kind of spread into do, to two. It's called Hosanna Rabbah. It's the great day of the festival. It's the greatest day. It's the big give day. Uh, but it says, then on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly as was required by the law. So seven days of, of joy, of, 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 you know, worshiping, of being excited, of feasting. But then that last day, the greatest day, was really a solemn event. Uh, it was a little more muted. And uh, I'll show you why Sunday. Did I mention it was cool? I thought I might. What's that? Just paper. <laughs> nope, Day of Atonement's later. Um, this sets off, th- this is called Hosanna or Hoshanna Raba, which means the great day of the festival or the great give day, if you will. Um, that kind of initiates a 10-day period of repentance, and then ultimately there's Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, that, that come later. Yep. So, do you have any questions, any insights before we go on into chapter 9? I'll also give you time at the end, too, as we're staring down 38 verses to get through. In thir- I'm going to do it. Here we go. <laughs> I don't have many stoppages, so verse 1. On October 31st, the people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. So these people are in great mourning for their prior sin. Um, Fasting was conducted as to say to the Lord, you know, God, we, we are so troubled by our sin that food at this moment just kind of seems unimportant. Burlap was worn to show their complete poverty of spirit before God. It's to say to the Lord, we're troubled by our sin. The normal comforts of life are just not important right now. And then in the same way, dust was put on the head to kind of show their, their lowly state before the Lord. So Israel is, is humble before God and before others. They aren't each doing this in their own home, I think is important. They're, they're not doing this individually, but they're all putting on sackcloth and putting ashes on their heads publicly. They're confessing sin to one another. Humility before the Lord, publicly confessing sin, it's all a part of repentance, true repentance. Sin loses its power when it's exposed to light, but it grows in the darkness. And that's where I had my great epiphany when I, when I talked to the guys this week and I shared them. Uh, it's the book of James Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man or woman has great power to prevail. So if you're stuck in a sin pattern, if you're battling a habitual sin, if you have an addiction you can't get out of, confess your sins to each other. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to admit it to God but also to somebody else, not to everybody. We're not going to put you on the platform and say, tell the church what you did last night. But tell somebody. Tell an individual. Bring it to the light in some way with somebody that you trust. And that sin, I assure you, if you keep exposing it to the light and keep bringing it out, it'll lose its power. Amen? You will be healed. So, verse 3. I said I was going to go fast. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours they confessed their sins and worshiped the Lord their God. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shabaniah, Bunny, Sherebiah, <laughs> Bunny and then Bonnie, Bonnie, Banny, and Kenanai stood on the stairway of the Levites and cried out to the Lord their God with loud voices. So these people were truly broke over their sin. You know, you only stand for three hours. I only stand for three hours for things that we are extremely devoted to, right? We're not going to do that for nothing. Um, Or you stand for three hours if you're in the military and the the drill sergeant says, you got to stand there, right, John? Um, Exactly. (laughs) I mean, what are some of those things that you, what what are reasons you've stood for three hours? I mean, have you ever? For what? 
to cash a check in the military. It's mon- money is a priority. What else? To see him, which one, Star Wars? Okay. It was important to you, right? You valued it that much where you stood in line. I know, I like that. So now uh, from here, verses 5 through 37 is one of the great prayers in the Old Testament. In fact, verses 5 through 37, they're the longest prayer recorded in the Bible. This is it. This is the longest prayer recorded in the Word. Yet, interestingly, it only takes six and a half minutes to read uh, from front to back. That's it. That's how long this prayer takes. That is to say, I think, that prayer doesn't have to be long to be glorious and to be effective. It can be short. Amen. So be it. But it's recorded, I believe, because the Lord through it is saying to us, this is how I desire you to pray. Take note with this sort of heart, with this sort of transparency, with this sort of priority. Be a prayer, son or daughter, like this. Model your prayer life after this. Verse 5. Then the leaders of the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, the bunny, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Petholiah called out to the people, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed. May your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserve them all and the angels of heaven worship you. I want you to note something. And I would write this down if you're taking notes. (laughs) The leaders start their prayer with A. You can put the letter A. They start with adoration. You are God. You are glorious. You are exalted. We too ought to start our prayers with adoration, with an A, because it encourages us in the Lord. It gives you confidence, me confidence in the Lord as we recall his attributes and his power. So we start our prayers out with A, adoration. Verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham, Abram and brought him from Ur of the Chaldeans and renamed him Abraham. You put the H in him. You put the spirit in him. When he had proved himself faithful, you made a covenant with him to give him and his descendants the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, you know it's coming, Jebusites, Girgashites, Stalactites, and Headlights. That's right. All those people were there. And you have done what you promised for you are always true to your word. Uh, Go back to the start of verse 8. It says, when Abram or Abraham proved himself, that's when God made a covenant with him. That sounds a whole lot like work by faith, doesn't it? Or work by, or faith by works, or, or salvation by works. But that word faithful There is the same exact word used in Genesis 15, 6 when it says, and he, that's Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, that's God, counted to him, Abram, it as righteousness. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. When Abram put his trust and his faith in God, specifically in God's promise to him, God credited this belief to Abram's account as righteousness. There are essentially two types of righteousness. There's righteousness that we accomplish by our own effort, and there's righteousness accounted to us by the work of God when we believe upon Jesus. Since none of us can be good enough to accomplish perfect righteousness, we must have God's righteousness accounted to us by doing just what Abraham did. He believed in the Lord. So God's accounting is not pretending. God does not account to us a pretend righteousness, but a real one in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the leaders praying this prayer, they start with adoring God, and now there's a recalling of the work God did previously in their lives. You know, a great practice for us when we pray to remember the past faithfulness of the Lord. It's a great thing to start your prayer out. It's part of adoration. Doing so gives us strength to rely on his faithfulness in the future. Verse 9, they continue, you saw the misery of our ancestors in Egypt, and you heard the cries beside the, the Red Sea. 
You displayed miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, his officials, and all his people, for you knew how arrogantly they were treating our ancestors. You have a glorious reputation that has never been forgotten. You divided the sea for your people so they could walk through on dry land, and then you hurled the enemies, our enemies, their enemies, into the depths of the sea. They sank like stones beneath the mighty waters. Verse 12, you led our ancestors by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night so that they could find their way. You came down at Mount Sinai and spoke to them from the heavens. You gave them regulations and instructions that were just and decrees and commands that were good. You instructed them concerning your holy Sabbath and you commanded them through Moses, your servant, to obey all your commands, decrees and instructions. You gave them bread from heaven when they were hungry and water from the rock when they were thirsty. You commanded them to go and take possession of the land you had sworn to give them. So while these people are realizing their serious sin and are in sackcloth and ashes here, while they're praying a prayer of repentance and praise, they say in adoration, God, you are glorious and you're worthy to, pr- to, to be praised. And also in adoration, they say, you've been so faithful. You've done a multitude of things for us. They list them. You've worked all things for our good and for your glory. But then, verse 16, but our ancestors were proud and stubborn, and they paid no attention to your commands. They refused to obey and did not remember the miracles you had done for them. Instead, they became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry and rich in unfailing love. You did not abandon them even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed terrible blasphemies. Verse 19. But in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud still led them forward by day and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Verse 22, then you helped our ancestors conquer kingdoms and nations, and you placed your people in every corner of the land. They took over the land of King Sihon of Heshbon and the land of King Og of Bashan, You made their descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and brought them into the land you had promised to their ancestors. They went in and took possession of the land. You subdued whole nations before them. Even the Canaanites who inhabited the land were powerless. Your people could deal with these nations and their kings as they pleased. Our ancestors captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took over houses full of good things with cisterns already dug and vineyards and olive groves and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate until they were full and grew fat and sassy and enjoyed themselves in all your blessings. Verse 26. You didn't know sassy was a Hebrew word, did you? But despite all this, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who warned them to return to you and they committed terrible blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies who made them suffer. But in their time of trouble, they cried to you and you heard them from heaven in your great mercy. You sent them liberators who rescued them from their enemies. But as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in your sight and once more you let their enemies conquer them. Yet whenever your people turned and cried to you again for help, you listened once more from heaven. In your wonderful mercy, you rescued them many times. I think that's an understatement. Verse 29. You warned them to return to your law, but they became proud and obstinate and disobeyed your commands. They did not follow your regulations by which people will find life if only they obey. They stubbornly turned their backs on you and refused to listen. In your love, you were patient with them for many years. You sent your spirit, who warned them through the prophets, but still they wouldn't listen. So once again, you allowed the peoples of the land to conquer them, but in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are. So in these verses, we see confession coupled with thanksgiving. 
You can put under that A, a C for confession, and a T for thanksgiving. They're saying, Lord, we were disobedient, we were stiff-necked, we, we turned away from you. But you helped our ancestors conquer kingdoms and nations, confession, thanksgiving. Lord, we were disobedient and, and rebelled against you, we turned our back on your law, confession. But in your wonderful mercy, you rescued us time and time again, thanksgiving. Confession coupled with thanksgiving. That's important when we pray. When you confess your sin, remember that you're praying to a father, a heavenly father, who loves you and who is ready to forgive. He's not standing there with a paddle like Andrew's dad, ready to beat you. He, he's standing there with his arms extended, ready to hug you. My dad <laughs> yeah, that one. Yes. Little Andrew. 1 John 1, 9, my favorite verse in the Bible. <laughs> the other one. It says, confess your sins to him, that is God, and he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all wickedness. Confession, all it is is to agree with God. It's to say the same thing that God is saying about your sin. It's to call wrong, wrong, and right, right. That's confession. But don't forget to couple confession with thanksgiving. When you pray, say, Lord, I know what I've done is wrong. I know I've sinned. I know I've acted unrighteously, selfishly. I don't make excuse for what I've done. I'm wrong, period. But you are so rich in mercy. And through the cross, you have washed my sin away. Thank you. Confession, thankfulness. And on and on you should go. Start your prayer with A, adoration. The middle part of your prayer should include C, confession, and T, thanksgiving. And finally, the way we should end our prayers, anybody know? Supplication. S, supplication. It's an acronym. Spells the word ACTS. A, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication. And that acronym just so happens to be the pattern of the longest prayer in the Bible. Supplication, of course, is the portion of our prayer of making our requests before the Lord. It's praying our prayer list. It's asking the Lord to act directly on our behalf. Listen to the leaders of Israel here. Listen to their sole request. Uh, finishing this chapter, almost. Verse 32. And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, here it is, do not let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and leaders and priests and prophets and ancestors, all of your people from the days when the kings of Assyria first triumphed over us until now. Every time you punished us, you were just. We have sinned greatly and you gave us only what we deserved. Our kings, leaders, priests, and ancestors did not obey your law or listen to the warnings in your commands and laws. Even while they had their own kingdom, they did not serve you, though you showered your goodness on them. You gave them a large, fertile land, but they refused to turn from their wickedness. So, verse 36, Now today we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of the kings whom you have sent over us because of our sins. That is, the Assyrian kings who are sovereign over them. They have power, not Assyrian, Persian. <laughs> Big difference, excuse me. They have power over us and our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure, and we are in great misery. So there's a sole request of these guys. There's a sole supplication in these final verses. It's in verse 32. Don't let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. That is interesting. This plea is that God would not view all their suffering lightly because what they want is not more justice per se. They know that God is just, but they are seeking his great mercy. That's what they're asking God to continue to show. They don't make the request explicit at this point, but they have been saying it all through this historical review. They, they've expressed how the Lord always has shown his people mercy, and they're asking him to do it again, give them mercy in their day. 
And so the argument that they've been making in the prayer is this. God is good to Israel. Israel sins. God shows mercy. They don't come right out and say it, but that's the case they're making. They want God to do it again. They want God to be merciful. They want God to show his mercy anew. And that's the supplication that they desire. And so as you pray and and acts prayer to the Lord in your own prayer life, and I hope you do, I'd encourage you to make that same argument, make that same plea. When you want to bless God, when you want to praise God, this is what you do. You, You take account of all his goodness to you, then make confession of your sins, You confess all your sins that you're aware of. You own up. You make a full accounting of all your iniquity. Don't forget to to remain thankful to him in that process, but then rehearse the repetitions of his mercies that he's given you before, and then ask for more. Amen? God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Final couple verses. The people responded, In view of all this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. The next chapter, we'll get to see all those names. Yay. But after their prayer and closing, the the leaders make a covenant to keep God's commands. After our prayer, we do well to go to the covenant. We don't make a covenant, but we go to the covenant that's already been made for us the covenant that was made through Christ's blood on the cross. If you or I, if we'll look at Jesus, if we'll trust God, if you'll do what the Levites have done here in Nehemiah 9, if you'll come to the place as the Levites do in verse 38, where you are ready to enter into a new covenant with God through Christ by the power of the Spirit in that particular request, then God will save you. Be that salvifically, coming to Him in salvation, or be that in that moment. God will show you his great mercies, his abundant compassion. Amen? Which means, so be it, established. All right. Your thoughts and comments and takeaways and insights (laughs) and corrections of my Hebrew language. true well study that because that is the intended meaning because our joy what's your joy do it goes up and down right my joy how can it be my strength in in times where i'm weak but the joy that the lord has is unchangeable it doesn't move and now i'm getting who calls me at 8 10 at night (laughs) But that is something unchangeable. And so in my weakness, man, God still joys over me. God still dances and sings <laughs> over me, even right now, even while I'm doing this, or I just did that. That's pretty amazing. It gives you the courage to come back. Chapter 9, verse 1, I heard you said on the 31st day. Yep. My Bible actually says the 24th day. Why really? Is does it say October 24th? It doesn't. No, it says on the Yep. So mine, mine is off of the Gregorian calendar. Yours is probably off of the, Jude- the, the Jewish calendar, since it just says the 24th day. It's probably talking about that Jewish month, whereas mine is transposing it to, so I as an American can understand it, yeah. NLT. I kind of like that the NLT does that for you, because mine doesn't do that. Yeah. Yep. Actually, mine is asterisked, and it says down in the notes, Hebrew, on the 24th day of the same month, the seventh month of the ancient Hebrew lunar calendar. Yep. So this day was actually in our calendar, October 31st, 445 B.C. So so two different trains of thought and translation. 
probably without looking at it. Yeah, I think that sounds right because they're started a couple months later. Yep. Anything else? Haley, do you have something before? It's a ripple effect that goes on down. Things our parents do affect us, and I see myself and my kids in ways that I don't want to, <laughs> like my stubbornness, Riley. Right? <laughs> yep, see it all the time. Yeah. We affect them. I thought it was interesting talking about instead of a stage as a platform and how we are a platform for God. God works. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's a good way to look at that too. I mean, I have a physical platform. Todd has a platform of overhead door to be a, a minister. You have a platform of a college. <coughs> you know what? Pioneered. Oh, I just did it. I'm sorry. I knew that. I messed up. Sorry. I think of my own. I have that in my house. That's like calling Jay a, f- a FedEx guy or a UPS guy. He gets see you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is that like calling me a a Lutheran? I don't know. <laughs> a rabbi? <laughs> yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We all got a platform. And the point isn't you. The point is preaching God's word. Yep. Anything else? We've got time for one or two more. Yeah. You know, and, and that really stands out to me there all the time. It makes me a turn must have really happened to all the people over these over this period of time when Ezra came and the temple got built and Nehemiah came and the, the walls began to get built because prior to that when they came from, from Babylon and whatnot, they probably were really all not really caring that much about, you know, mm-hmm. the worship of, of the Lord. Yeah. yeah. I think what they had was the word of the prophets that said the temple would re- be, be rebuilt, the walls would be reestablished, and I think they were like, it happened. God is so evident. Oh, man, wouldn't that? Like when I start seeing revelation <laughs> coming to mind, and it's dangerous to be a, 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 a newspaper prophet, right? Uh, but man, I mean, read Ezekiel, th- read Ezekiel 38 this week with the understanding that Gog and Magog is Russia. Okay, read that. 
and report back. But just tell me if it gets you excited a little bit, you know. Um, I'm not saying this war is that. Could be. Um, we'll see, right? We watch and see. We, we look for the signs of the times, etc. <laughs> I do believe that we're in the end times. I think we're seeing an increase in um, disasters and in, in wars. There will be wars and rumors of wars, you know. There hasn't been a war officially, you know what I mean, in this capacity for, uh, well, since the 40s, really, right? I know we've had skirmishes, etc. Vietnam, I was in one, Iraq war, but not to this where a sovereign nation uh, goes inside of the borders of another sovereign nation to this degree. It's interesting. Read that sometime. Find a good commentary um, and just read that. Even uh, John MacArthur, uh, David Guzik, Greg Laurie. Um, it's interesting what's going on. But I think these people were empowered by this, knowing that, uh, hey, the word of God was fulfilled, and we're, we're seeing it in different ways. If not this, we're, we're seeing it in different ways. We did see a fulfillment of prophecy where the Bible says that Israel would be, after being dispersed, would be put back into their own cities, into their own land. They'd become a sovereign nation again, and they would speak they would speak their original language, Hebrew. That occurred in 1948 with the establishment of, of Israel. We saw prophecy well, fulfilled. If any of you guys follow Brian Young um, on the uh, thing that he's getting ready to start with the Bible study for Revelation starting on Thursday. Nice. Awesome. I was wondering where we put those. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's an undertaking, which is, Brian ought to do that. Very good. Well, let's close in prayer. If you guys want to hang out, you certainly can. You want to pray? Go ahead, Melissa. You're raising your hand. Please. You raised your hand. Uh, yes. Let's pray for Tanya. Would you pray for Tanya? Well, I was going to ask if we could pray for Tanya in Tanya's presence. Sure. <laughs> Go yeah. bombard her in this mess. <laughs> oh, you have a to pray for her. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys, if your kids are up there, just love Tanya. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me say a quick prayer, and then if you want to come up and pray with Tanya, we'll go right up there right now, and we'll just surround her and pray for her. Sound okay? I think she'll be blessed by that. Father, we thank you for this word, and um, we thank you for the work that you're going to do in it, through us, um, and in us, as we let these words renew our minds. Uh, Father, we do pray with the uh, alignment to that verse in Romans 12, I believe, that would be, we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That occurs when we get into your word and when we're able to think your thoughts. Thank you for these people. Thank you for their faithfulness in, in uh, studying your word and being eager for it. And Father, we just pray for more like them and so that we would be filled with your word and that others would know you. Lord, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.